Thank you, Ruth, for that wonderful, arousing prelude. And welcome to all who are worshiping with us today in the sanctuary, the nine who are gathered here, and for those outside um, under the big tree, if you're listening on KIOW radio or um, live stream, or will catch up with us later in the week on our YouTube channel, um, we're glad you're with us to worship today. It is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost and the beginning of a five-week um, delayed programming of our VBS program. So we're thankful to have Cora and Tatum and Isabel and Tori with us today to lead us in our opening songs and to learn a little bit about the Rocky Railway um, where Jesus pulls us through. Um, if you had been here uh, minutes before and didn't know if we had technical difficulties or not, um, and with me trying to get a sermon ready and having it um, somewhere disappear in the ethernet last night, um, it's good to just take a break and listen to a good old VBS program where we um, learn again how Jesus um, speaks to us um, through these Bible stories and songs. So thank you all for being with us um, to begin our VBS program. So I will change, uh, well, a couple of other announcements. Um, I was asked to announce that um, the, e the um, WELCA welcome meeting scheduled for this week has been postponed. And the senior choir, which normally would begin um, a meeting um, on Wednesdays, um, oh, I wish it was so, but that too will be postponed um, for um, the current time. And we are working towards, and hopefully uh, we'll be gathering for in-person worship beginning next week. Um, there's notes on the doors and there will be um, information put out in a variety of um, sources so that you can find out what that will be like and what that will mean for us. Um, but we're thankful after over four months to have figured out a plan we hope will keep us safe and that we can participate um, in in-person worship along with the ways we have been worshiping in various places uh, throughout this pandemic. So um, with that, let's begin Vacation Bible School. I'll switch places with all of you. If you want to come up to the chancel area, And we will sing our opening song, Everywhere I Go. Everywhere I go, I sing round, I know everywhere I go with you. So I won't be afraid in our own Everywhere I go with you, where I go, I go with you. There's a spirit that I cannot contain. There's a spirit that I cannot contain. The same power that raised Jesus up from the grave. There's a spirit I cannot contain. Everywhere I go, I sing how I am low. Everywhere I go with you, so I won't be afraid. This I know, I'm not made. Where I go, I go with you. Oh, 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 oh. I go, I go with you. Everywhere I go with you, everywhere I go with you, where I 
so I go with you. Awesome. Why don't you guys come and sit down? That was a joyful song. So today we begin um, our first week of our VBS program, uh, Rocky Well Railway, where we learn Jesus' power pulls us through. Now we need to remember that sometimes life seems a bit, bit rocky and things get hard, but Jesus' power pulls us through. So that's kind of the first story and memory verse for today is um, how Jesus' power will pull us through throughout this whole program. Today's Bible story is about a man named Ananias who was called by God to do something really hard, to take care of a man named Saul who had been kind of a bully to people who follow Jesus. And um, um, this bully named Saul met Jesus on the road and now he needs care by this man named Ananias. And um, what we learn is um, it can be hard when you are asked to do something by Jesus, um, but Jesus gets them back on track. And why is that? Because Jesus' power pulls us through. Very good. So here's the story about Ananias who helps Saul. At this time, Saul was breathing down the necks of the master's disciples out for the kill. He went to the chief priests and got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus. So that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether a man or a woman, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. And so Saul set off on his journey. When he got to the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you out here to get me? He said, who are you, master? The voice says, I am Jesus, the one you are hunting down. I want you to get up and enter the city, and in the city you will be told what to do next. All his companions stood there dumbstruck. They could hear the sound, but they could not see anyone. While Saul, picking himself up from the ground, found himself stone blind. They had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus, and he continued to be blind for three days. He ate nothing and drank nothing. Now there was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias, and the master spoke to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, master, he answered. Get up and go over to the straight avenue and ask of the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He is there praying. He has just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he has been doing his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him a license to do the same to us. But the master said, don't argue, just go. I have picked him as my personal representative to the Gentiles and the kings and the Jews. And now I am about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with his job. So Ananias went and found the house, placed his hands on the blind Saul and said, Brother Saul, the master sent me, the same Jesus you saw on your way here. He sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like the scales fell from his soul's eyes and he could see again. And he got to his feet and was baptized and sat down with them for a hearty meal. So today we learn on the Rocky Railway how Jesus' power helps us do hard things. And so today we are going to meet um, our first Bible buddy, Ramsey, who is going to help us learn our first Bible memory verse, for I can do everything through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. That's Philippians 4, verse 13. So let's look at the modern monitor and watch our video on Ramsey. Hey there, friends. Glad you're all on board for a rambunctious week of faith and fun at Rocky Railway. I'm Ramsey, a bighorn 
one cheek. Um, can you guess why? <laughs> okay, that was too easy. Check out these cool, curvy horns God gave me. Ram's horns can weigh up to 30 pounds. That's as much as some of our littlest preschool buddies. Wow! My horns have to be tough because we male sheep use them to keep other rams out of our territory. People who study rams say we can run into each other at 20 to 40 miles per hour. Bam! You can hear that sound for miles! Me and my herd hang out all over the majestic, massive Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains rock! If you head up to find me, strap on your hiking boots. Sometimes my herd grazes in an alpine meadow. Cause that's where the good stuff is. Wow, good. But the meadow makes us an easy target for predators. So we also like to climb way up the crazy cliffs. We sheep like it steep. Me and my family can hang out on a little teeny tiny ledge that's only a few inches wide. Animals like bears or coyotes can't bother us here. Woo! And check out the view! God made us just right for staying safe in those hard, rocky places. My hooves are split and have a rough skin on the bottom that grips tight to the rugged rocks. Plus, I've got excellent eyesight. No glasses for me. It may sound like climbing these cliffs and balancing on jagged ledges is hard to do. But God has given me everything I need to live here. Find food and my family safe. I've heard that you sometimes have to do hard things too. When there's a bully at school, maybe you feel like you're in a rough, rocky place. You may not be balanced on a cliff ledge like me, but maybe you have to balance homework, chores, sports, music, and friendships. That sounds hard. Hmm, maybe coming here today and making new friends even feels like a hard thing for you. But did you know you don't face those hard things alone? No way! Jesus is right beside you. Yep, even right now. He gives you his power to climb through those mountains of worry and get through any rough stuff you gotta do. The Bible powers you up with this truth. For I can do everything Christ who gives me strength. That means you don't have to have your own power to do hard things. Jesus' power helps us do hard things. Trust Jesus. So, thanks for being with us. This has been a, um, a hard thing to get started, and I'm sure it's some um, things that you're Struggling with is hard, but we learn um, today and through the week that Jesus helps us do hard things. So um, when you go home, or if you're already home, you will have a little kit with um, the music and your Bible buddy verses to, and some stories and some um, crafts to do to kind of help you um, participate in Vacation Bible School wherever you are. But thank you, um, the four of you, for being with us today. And if you could help lead us in our um, theme song, for Rocky Railway, your power will help us pull us through. So let's sing that together. We trust, we, we trust. trust. We trust in you, Jesus, you're all, you're all, you're all that we need. Your power will call us through. We're trusting in you, we're trusting in you. You keep us whole and love that's forever. You keep us whole and we stand together. Your power will call us through. We're trusting in you. Trusting in you. We roll on this journey, there's no turning back. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right track. Oh, 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 oh. Wide open spaces, through wide open arms. We're looking again for the next place. 
surprise. Whoa, 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 whoa. We trust, we trust, we trust in you, Jesus. We're all, we're all, you're all that we need. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you. We're trusting in you. Trusting in you, trusting in you. We're off on this journey, there's no, no turning back. With Jesus to lead us, us, we're on the right track. Oh, 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 oh. Wide open spaces, we're on the dark and night. We're looking ahead for the next big surprise. Oh, oh, oh. We trust, we trust in you, Jesus, we're all, we're all, we're all that we need, your power will pull us through, we're trusting in you, we're trusting in you, and hope will never be passed out, we stand together, your power pull us through, we're trusting in you. We're trusting in you. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you. We're trusting in you. Awesome. Thank you for getting us on the right track with VBS, Rocky Railway. You can go sit down. What a gift to have young people back in the sanctuary with us today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear, I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Steadfast in your 
chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in, in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall praise, give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of faith. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God. According to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owned him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay the debt. But he refused, and he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. 
When the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord what all had taken place. And then his Lord summoned him and said to him, Oh, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers or your sisters from your heart. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, O Christ. Sisters and brothers, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Peter asks the question, how many times do I have to forgive? And it's a fair question. When Peter thinks seven times is enough, it is biblically a pretty good answer. In the Bible, the number seven signifies completeness and perfection. In the book of Genesis, we read that when God created the world and all that exists, he did so in six days. And then he said it was all good. And on the seventh day, he finished the work that he had done. And he rested and he blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. It was complete. It was close, as close to perfect as anyone could imagine. There are seven holy days celebrated in the Hebrew calendar, beginning with Passover and ending with the last great day, on the seventh day of the festival of the Feast of the Tabernacles, celebrated every fall. This never-ending celebration of seven festivals is the cycle that tells the story of salvation that reminded the people of God of God's never-ending life-saving activity among God's people. Year after year in a series of sevens, they would hear this story. The Bible as a whole was originally divided into seven major divisions. The total number of originally inspired books was 49, or seven times seven, so constructed to illustrate the completeness and absolute perfection of the Word of God. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, every seventh year, the law states... All debts shall be forgiven, and every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against his neighbor, and every seventh year all slaves, male and female, should be freed. In Hebrew culture, a person who could not pay a debt could be sold into indentured servitude. It's what we heard in our gospel lesson for today. But after six years, the law stated that they were to be freed. And they were not to be sent away empty-handed for their six years of unpaid service, but provided for liberally from the master's flock and threshing floor and wine press, giving them some of the bounty which the Lord God had blessed them. And so when Peter imagines that forgiving a member of the church that has sinned against him as many as seven times, one might say it was a pretty good answer. It made perfect sense, theologically and biblically. But why does Jesus expect more? So let's put this in context. Jesus has taught them what to do if another member of the church sins against you. When that happens, you are to point out the fault when the two of you are alone. And if the matter is resolved, all is well and good. But if a matter is not resolved and the conflict continues, you are to take one or two witnesses along so that every word may be confirmed and hopefully there can be some resolution. And if the conflict continues, it needs to go before the church in hopes of some reconciliation. And if agreement cannot be reached, the offender is to be treated as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now let's back up a little bit 
and look at the story Jesus told right before this teaching about how church discipline is supposed to be played out and how many times one must forgive and how to manage disputes among members of the church. If you back up, you find this short little parable about the shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he leaves the 99 to search for the one who is lost. So how does Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Well, like lost sheep. The Pharisees and the scribes and elders of the church have been critical of Jesus and his ministry because he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He seems to go out of his way to care for the unwanted, the lost, the marginalized, and all that are excluded among them. He heals their diseases, casts out their demons, and feeds those who are hungry. Jesus has compassion for them because they are all like sheep without a shepherd, Matthew tells us. Tradition has it that Matthew himself, the one who wrote this gospel, was a tax collector. So have that in mind as we think about how Jesus treated tax collectors. He called them in and prepared them to preach the gospel. The point Matthew's gospel seems to be making is that Jesus never stops reaching out, seeking the lost and gathering them in. So for Peter, the sensible and biblically complete and perfect number seemed like a good answer. Peter, like most of us, I think, want to see results and somehow track how this business of forgiveness is going for us. Can we somehow keep a scorecard so we can know when we've done our due diligence and then we can call it quits and give up on this business of forgiveness? But Jesus never gives up. Jesus goes on to tell to Peter and the rest about this slave who owed his master 10,000 talents. Now that's an awful lot of debt. A day's wage was a denarii, and 6,000 denarii are equal to one talent. So if the slave owes 10,000 talents, it's the equivalent of 60 million denarii. It's the debt of an average small country. And so for Peter, this would be an insurmountable debt to pay. And I think that's the point Jesus is trying to make. See, in contract to that, this servant who is forgiven that debt goes to a second service servant who owns, owes a hundred denarii. Now that's still a pretty large debt, but it is not an insurmountable debt to pay. And yet the servant that was so liberally forgiven of his debt is unreasonably harsh with the one who owes him considerably less. So why can't the servant who has been given, forgiven much forgive the much smaller, more manageable debt that is due him? We pray, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors as Jesus taught us to pray. And that is such a hard concept for us to understand. I think what we learn is this business of forgiveness really isn't a business at all. It's a process. It happens through prayer. It happens wherever two or three are gathered and there is a recognition that God is among them. It happens as we practice forgiveness with each other knowing it is what God has called us to do. It's what Jesus has taught us to do. It's a communal affair. And it affects our communities in many positive ways. And it takes a lot of prayer and practice and patience and persistence, this process called forgiveness. So what did it mean for Peter to be forgiven by Jesus for his often impetuous behavior or his talking without thinking or his denial of Jesus when it mattered most? 
And what about Paul in our VBS story this morning? When Paul meets the risen Christ, who has to get his attention on the road to Damascus and convince him to stop persecuting his followers. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus has to convince Ananias to offer forgiveness and care to Paul. This was hard reconciling work to be done. But look what it accomplished. Look at the results. Paul made his mission to reach out to the Gentiles and share the good news of the risen Christ. And Paul convinces others to welcome those who are weak in faith, not just for the purpose of quarreling over opinions as he once would, things about dietary laws or Sabbath, when it should be observed. He asks, why do we pass judgment on our brothers and sisters? And what a 183 and 180 degree shift this was for Saul, who is now Paul, the former persecutor of Christians. Being forgiven, he could now be forgiving. See, forgiveness is the work of the church. It's what works, the work that begins in us as our sins are forgiven. Not just seven times, but innumerable times. So we too can enter into this saving work of reconciliation. And it's hard, I know. But it also can be freeing and healing and good for our souls and good for the souls of others. It can lead to a host of positive outcomes and allow us to grow. Letting go of old grudges can free us up for the service we are called to do for others. And yes, it will have to be about forgiveness for them as well. Like the communities of Paul, who wrote to the formation of the early church, in so many cities, in so many places. It will take compromise. We will have to be open to diversity of thought and action. But this life-redeeming work brings in the kingdom of God and makes us grow. And that is our hope, that Jesus' power will get us through. Amen. <laughs> Our own.
together we confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of, of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, our Lord, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, died, and, died, and was buried. He, he descended to the dead. dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes, and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine poverty, and war. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. Thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you, and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in this um, week when we think about forgiveness, we often um, forget that that is an extension of God's peace. And so let's be forgiving and share the peace of the Lord with all we meet in the coming week. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with you. We share that peace. We pray our offering prayer. 
Almighty God, grant that your holy word, which has been proclaimed this day, may enter into our hearts through your grace, that we may produce in us the fruit of the Spirit for witness and service in the world, and to the praise and honor of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray as our Lord taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive this blessing. Mothering God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the ways of truth and life. Amen. Amen. Remember the poor. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.